All right, Job chapter 11. I know we finished up Job chapter 11 last week, so we'll just do a quick review, and we'll get back right into chapter 12. We left the house this morning, I thought... Uh, the Holy Spirit came down and we just couldn't see to drive, but it was fog. <clears throat> Job chapter 11. In Job chapter 11, Zophar um, was, took his turn to Job, uh, at Job, and we've seen the same, uh, the same as we saw from his two friends. And um, Zophar, he was a little more, um, I guess you could say, forward and a little more bold with Job. And uh, asked some questions that uh, will, that were good questions to ask, I suppose, and, and uh Brought out some some things that we studied and uh, uh, looked at as far as the nature of God and uh, how can man discover God and find out God and we we found out that the only way man can discover God is if God allows him. But God did reveal Himself. He wants to be discovered. He wants to be known. He wants to have a relationship with His people. And uh, and then we've seen so far. Uh, again, accusing Job of being uh, uh, out of sorts with God and uh, just needing to get right with God and repent. And uh, while there probably were some things that Job needed to repent of, I'm sure he, pro he probably did. He probably took care of that already. Um, and then, but we, no doubt, in, or we took those things that Zophar had said and and then applied them. Uh, to us because they are right about repentance and uh, our sin and what sin does and uh, in our lives. But then we get to Job chapter 12 and now Job chapter 12 is Job's answer to Zophar. <laughs> so let's uh, read Job chapter 12 and... Uh, and we'll get right into it. Job chapter 12, the Bible says, And Job answered and said, No doubt, but ye are the people, and wisdom shall die with you. But I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you, yea, who knoweth not such things as these. I am as one mocked of his neighbor, who calleth upon God, and he answereth him. The just upright man is laughed to scorn. He that is ready to slip with his feet is as a lamp despised, in the thought of him that is at ease. The tabernacles of robbers prosper, and they that provoke God are secure in to whose hand God bringeth abundantly. But ask now the beast, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee. Or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. Who knoweth not all these things? I'm sorry, all these that the hand of the Lord... <clears throat> Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind? Doth not the ear try words, and the mouth taste his meat? But the ancient is wisdom, and in length of days understanding. With him is wisdom and strength, and he hath counsel and understanding. Behold, he breaketh down, and it cannot be built again. He shutteth up a man, and there can be no opening. Behold, he withholdeth the waters, and they dry up also. He sendeth them out, and they overturneth the earth. With him is strength and wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are his. He leadeth counselors away spoiled, and maketh the judges fools. He looseth the bond of kings, and girdeth their loins with a girdle. He leadeth princes away spoiled, and overthroweth the mighty. He removeth away the speech of the trusty, and taketh away the understanding of the aged. He poureth contempt upon princes, and weakeneth the strength of the mighty. He discovereth deep things out of darkness, and bringeth out to light the shadow of death. 
He increaseth the nations and destroyeth them. He enlargeth the nations and straighteneth them again. He taketh away the heart, excuse me, he taketh away the heart of the chief of the people of the earth and causeth them to wander in the wilderness, in a wilderness where there is no way. They grope in, in the dark without light and he maketh them to stagger like a drunken man. So Job, now as he's done with the other two, has now uh, is picking up his rebuttal, I guess you could say, and his defense. Uh, again, remember that Job has, what Job has gone through, what he's, what he's endured, uh, the loss of his livelihood, the loss of his family, and the loss of his health. And uh, with the exception of his wife, he's, he has his wife, but she kind of... Uh, she's going through it with him. Uh, no doubt, uh, you know, we kind of get put get get on Job's wife a little bit about uh, telling him to curse God and die, but she was just <laughs> didn't want to see him suffer, so figured the easiest way out, you know, assisted suicide. <laughs> uh, but uh, but she's going through it with him. But uh, no doubt, Job is he's gone through what he what uh, he's endured and. And his three friends come, and they, they come with good intentions, you remember. They came to, to mourn with him and to comfort him. But uh, as they sat there and, and began, you know, what's the old saying? If uh, the, uh, the idle mind is the devil's playground. You know, if you sit somewhere too long and, and, and uh, think about something too long, <laughs> you're, you're liable, the, the, the tendencies are to start putting your ideas in and putting your uh you know thoughts into something but uh instead of meditating upon god and his word we get, we begin to surmise and we begin to surmise we begin to put into and that's what joe uh job's three friends have done they they sat there for a while for who knows how long and begin to think about what job's gone through and and and, and it it crossed their mind that he had to have been a wicked person in order for God to let all these things happen to him. Now, there is some truth in into that thought. I mean, you know, we know that man reaps what he sows. And uh, so, but when you, when you approach uh, somebody that is, maybe in the same position that Job's in, be careful to jump to conclusions. I mean, if, there's, if it's evident, you know, you know, by their fruits you shall know them. If it's evident, then, you know, you can, you can uh, believe what you want and, and then just pray for the individual and, and try to guide them, try to uh, rebuke them, uh, reprove them, whatever God leads you to do. But if there's no evidence, don't don't jump to conclusions. It could be just the same situation here that God is just just doing something to uh, bring glory to uh, all things work together for good to them that love God. We know Job loves God, <clears throat> and so that's where Job's at. So Job is on the other side of the, this misjudging, this, this this misunderstanding of his situation. And uh, as we see here, when he starts speaking in Job chapter 12, he's getting a little frustrated, to say the least. He says in verse 1 and 2, and Job answered and said, No doubt, but ye are the people, and wisdom shall die with you. <clears throat> so it's evident that Job is getting fed up here with his detractors, and even in all his agony and misery, even all, with all the, the pain he's in, all the, the, the sorrow he's experiencing, he still finds it within himself to be sarcastic. Job sarcastically suggests here that his three friends are the only people on earth, the only ones left on earth that retain wisdom, and once they're gone, there goes the wisdom. Uh, you, if, if, if you, when you read the Bible and you come across verses like this, you can only you can only chuckle because it shows you that 
uh, the the nature of man, the um, uh, the attitude of man hasn't changed much. I'm uh, you wouldn't probably wouldn't believe this, but if you ask my wife, <clears throat> I'm a little sarcastic myself, and uh, sarcasm is it's meant. And when 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 people are sarcastic, it's for a purpose. Typically, usually it's to to bring a, forth a point, to prove a point. And uh, here, Job is obviously obviously being sarcastic. He's not. Uh, he doesn't naturally. Job doesn't believe this. What he, this statement that he just said. And while he may not be saying it with a grin, he's. I'm sure Job is not. You know, in a in a comical mood. He's not up there. You know. Uh, you know, jovial and, and, and being funny. The irony in his statement is very comical. But it's hard-hitting also to the reader and to, no doubt, Zophar himself and his other two friends. One W.F. Adney said this, Some evils cannot, can, I'm sorry, Some evils can be best met just by being exposed. Now, irony is a method of showing a thing in an unexpected light, so that while admitting all its claims, we make it apparent that those very claims are absurd. Slight failings will be best castigated with simple ridicule, more serious ones, if they are not great sins, with grave irony. And so that's what Job's doing. He's trying to point out the, the absurdity of the statements that Zophar, Bildad, and his these Job's three friends have made. Uh, the absurdity in the statements that they just, off the cuff, come to Job with unfounded, unsubstantiated claims, and they say it with such confidence and such, you know, uh, a surety that... Job is just flabbergasted. Have I mean, you ever come across those folks that, uh, you know, it's very evident that they haven't got a clue, but boy, they're very, when they, when they speak, you would think that, uh, you know, they had studied on the subject for, for years and they're masters at it, but uh, they, they don't have a clue. And, that's, and, and Job, knowing himself, knowing what uh, he's been through, knowing what he's, what he's done in his life, knowing that he's still a sinner, he's admitted that, but knowing that this is not happening because he is, you know, a secret murderer or a secret sinner of some sort, he knows the absurdity of their statements and how foolish and how uh, unfounded they are. And so he, he be, resorts to sarcasm and irony. No doubt, but ye are the people, and wisdom shall die with you. No doubt there's been times that you've thought that, <laughs> talking to somebody. May not have said it, but you've thought it. Uh, but irony has its place in scriptures. There's, there's many places uh, in the Bible where you've come across statements such as this that are ironical. Uh, for we'll give, look at some examples in First Kings chapter eighteen. Turn your Bibles back to First Kings chapter eighteen. And here is the famous story of Elijah and the, his uh, battle with the prophets of Baal. And you. Remember the story? I mean, uh, you know, the prophets of Baal, they were, you know, many in number and and they they were gathered together to to prove Elijah and to disprove Elijah. And here in 1 Kings chapter 18 we see verse look we'll start with verse 7 and as Obadiah was in the way, behold Elijah met him and he knew him and fell on his face and said, "Art thou that my Lord Elijah, and he answered, I, answered him, I am, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, what have I, what have I sinned, and that thou wouldest deliver thy servant to the hand of Ahab to slay me? As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom, whether my Lord hath not sent to seek thee, 
And when they, and when they said, He is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. And now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. And let's come bring, bring it down to verse 17. It says, And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, that thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel into Mount Carmel. And the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together into Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. I mean, this is some, uh, you know, <laughs> pretty pointed preaching going on, Elijah's doing. Uh, he's he's mad. He's angry at the the direction the nation of Israel are going, uh, the, and the and the people uh, following uh, this false prophet and this fa- these false prophets and the false god. And verse twenty two said, then it said Elijah unto the people, I even I only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are four hundred fifty men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood. And put no fire under, and I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And call ye the name of the, uh, on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, the God. <clears throat> and the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first. For ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning uh, even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered, and they leaped upon the altar which was made. I mean, you can, can you get the picture of what's going on here? Elijah says, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm fed up with this. We're going to get this settled once and for all. Who is God? You, he's mad at the nation of Israel for, for following after. I mean, kind of like we are, you know, with our nation right now. You know, they're... Never mind. And so he says, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to, you guys get your sacrifice ready. I'll get mine ready. And we'll see who's, who's, who's God. And so these prophets, 450 prophets. All right. They're getting their, 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 the bullock ready. And they, they, they dress it and they put it under the, under the wood. And then they start calling out to their God and they're, you know, who knows what they're doing. They're probably speaking in tongues. They're probably doing all kinds of things and just roam, you know, lay on the ground barking like dogs, whatever, you know, these false prophets do in these days. And it says that they're, they're so, you know, they, they keep crying out and nothing's happening. And they're so frustrated, they're leaping up on the altar and they're, they're doing all the kinds of things, trying to bring their God and let their God uh, react. <clears throat> and they took, look at verse uh, uh, 27. Now here's an ira. Here's irony in the Bible. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. He's, he's making fun of them. Now, we won't go into what some of the newer versions put in there. <laughs> you know, uh, it's very irreverent, but uh, but nonetheless, Elijah is is mocking their God, mocking them because he knows their God is not real, and he can't mock something that's can't hear, right? And so he's mocking these prophets, and he he's very ironical in his statements. So Elijah uses irony and. We know the story, and so Elijah cries, and God hears him and consumes the the offering, and it's just a great story. Look at uh, a couple chapters later, 1 Kings chapter 22. It 
here's a, the story of Jehoshaphat and Ahab and uh, going to war against the Assyrians and another wonderful story in your Bible. If you, if you get bored with the Bible, you've got a problem. Uh, here, the, the, you know, Jehoshaphat is, he's a kind of a wishy-washy guy and he's kind of going back and forth. He knows better than to be in league with Ahab, uh, but uh, he's still in league with him and he wants to do right, but and he, he and he's really concerned about what God thinks of the thing, and so he says in verse seven, "Is there not a prophet here, a prophet of the Lord, besides that we might inquire of him?" Because you know Ahab had his guys that just lost <laughs> an obvious battle a couple chapters earlier with Elijah, you know, and and he wasn't getting very many answers. And they're telling them, you know, Ahab's prophets are telling them, yeah, yeah, go up to the battle because you're going to win. And Jehoshaphat wasn't buying it. Jehoshaphat said, listen, I'm not, I'm not going with, you know, Benny Hinn over here. I want, I want to hear, I want to hear a man of God tell me that this is the right thing to do. And so, verse 8, And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. For he doth not prophesy good concerning me. He's not going to tell me what I want to hear. He's not going to, you know, tickle my ears. He's not going to, you know, uh, uh, pat my shoulder and, and pat me on the back and, and tell me how good I am. And then, you know, the positive message that God wants us to win today. No, that's not what he's, he, he knows better. He says, let not the king, Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. You know, why, why are you talking like that? Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, hasten hither Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before them. Zedekiah, the son of uh, Chenina, made him horns of iron. <laughs> and he said... Thus saith the Lord, with thee shalt thou push the Syrians until thou have consumed them. Now they're resorted to, you know, uh, making, you know, little fake horns and, and, and doing a, like a skit in front of these kings. To, it's amazing. And all the prophets prophesied said, so, saying, go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper. You know, Joel Osteen, can you smile today? For the Lord shall deliver it unto the king's hand. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold, now the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. You know, don't say right. Don't, don't preach truth. Just tell us, just, you know, tell them what they want to hear. It'd be best for you. That's what he's trying to say. Making them an offer he can't refuse. In other words, and Micaiah said, as the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. And so he starts out with a bold attitude that he's going to go and he's going to tell them exactly what the Lord said. But somewhere on the way, I don't know if he got a little, little uh, scared, if he got a little, maybe he just said, decided, ah, eh, I'll tell them what they want to hear. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, <laughs> Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. I can imagine that's exactly how he said it. Very insincere, knowing that that's not what God wanted. Go ahead, God is going to deliver. That's what you want to hear. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? And then he goes and he tells him the truth, what's going to happen. So, very ironical story in your Bible. Christ also, in his ministry, used irony many times uh, when dealing with the Pharisees. Look at Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Again, irony is a, a method of putting your, getting your point across by being absurd. Mark chapter 2. Uh, 
And we'll begin reading verse 13. And he went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitude resorted unto him, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with, uh, with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? Now look at verse 17. This is Jesus speaking. When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of, a, of the physician, but they that are sick. I mean, he's, he's bringing out a point that's obvious. It's, it's very obvious that somebody that's healthy does not need to go to the doctor. I mean, you know, we go for normal checkups and such and like that, but you're not just going to wake up one morning and say, oh, I feel pretty good today, I'm going to go to the doctor. Christ used an irony. And then also look at Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Now, we know what Paul dealt with in, in, in the church of Corinth. He dealt with a worldly group of uh, Gentiles that had gotten saved and had a lot of problems from their past, and they, a lot of those things followed them after they got saved into the church. And Paul just had to deal with them, not only with their fornication issues, but just their, their, their personal uh, dealings with each other, one another, and getting along and... And, 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 you know, uh, trying to get over on the other person. And, but Paul, as he's writing this letter to the, to the church of Corinth, he is himself getting a little frustrated and uh, upset with how they're acting. And he says, look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Verse 6, And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou uh, didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory? And as if thou hadst not received it. Verse 8, Now ye are full, now ye are rich, ye have reigned as kings without us, and I would to God he did reign, that we also might reign with you. Here Paul is being sarcastic. He's being uh, using irony to bring a point across to these Corinthians. He says, you guys, you know, you're rich and uh, full and have need of nothing, as, as the Bible says in, in the book of Revelation, knowing that it's the opposite. They're, they're spiritually poor. They may have a lot of money, uh, but and they may be... Uh, you know, doing well financially, but spiritually and doctrinally, they're poor. He says, For I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. He said, You guys are living it up, and, you know, we that are trying to do right and, and do the will of God are being made a spectacle. It's not, it's not going so well for us. He says, we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. He says, listen, we're, we become fools, but you guys know it all. You know, you ever deal with teenagers? They think they know it all. I don't know, we probably did too when we were that age. For I think that God has set, I'm sorry, back in verse 10, we are fools for Christ's sake and ye are wise. We are weak, but ye are strong. Paul knows that what he's saying is not true. He's being sarcastic. He's being ironical. But ye are strong, ye are honorable, but we are despised. Uh, and so irony has its place in Scripture. Just as Job is using it here to, to, to point out the absurdity of the statements of Zophar and his two buddies, so we see it used in other places in Scripture. Now you can use it and you can use it for a purpose, but it can also go too far. <laughs> so just watch it. 
Job chapter 12, back in, uh, Job chapter 12, verse 3. He says, But I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you, yea, who knoweth not such things as these. Job says, listen, I, I know exactly what you're saying. Who doesn't? In this day and age, they didn't have, you know, TV and uh, all the things that, that make it, keep us busy. People just st- studied God and Job says, listen, who doesn't know about what you've spoken? He says, I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you. Yea, who knoweth such, not such things as these? Job's provoked confidence. Notice Job, is, they're provoking this out of him. They're, this is part of God's work probably, the, to, to, to purge some things from Job. And God will use, he'll use whoever to do, the, to do the work in your life. He'll use uh, you know, people that just rub you the wrong way to pull some things out of you that you don't know are there. And so Job's provoked confidence in his knowledge and understanding is very similar to that of the Apostle Paul. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Job's telling his friends, you can't, he tells them basically, you're not telling me nothing that I don't already know. You know, who do you think you are? Who do you think I am? And in a, in a way, uh, you know, it's, it's good to have that confidence because we see the Apostle Paul had it as well. And you have to have, you have to be that way with certain people, with certain individuals. You have to just be careful uh, with, with that uh, spirit, that attitude in certain situations. But here, um, Paul was in the same boat. Paul was a man that had persecuted God and persecuted the church of God. And all the disciples and the believers before him knew it. They knew who Paul was. They knew exactly what he had done. And so they were a little leery. And even after he got saved, some of them just wouldn't accept him. Some of them just, you know, uh, said, you know, they, they just, they were, they were cautious of Paul. Not not uh, believing that he had gotten the whole boat, I guess. Second Corinthians chapter eleven. So Paul is provoked to make such statements as this, and obviously under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as well. Paul says in wrote in Second uh, Corinthians chapter eleven, he's warning the the, uh, the Corinthians to be. Uh, you know, not to listen to every, not to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine that comes through. Not to listen to every, uh, you know, Tom, Dick, and Harry that comes bringing some other uh, kind of teaching. And he says in verse 1, Would to God you could bear with me a little of my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means... As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been... Truly made manifest among you in all things. Paul is letting them know his credentials. He says, I was, he says, I'm not, uh, you know, some Yahoo that come off, uh, you know, some pumpkin truck down the road. He says, I'm, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm right up there with the chiefest apostles. And again, this is a provoke. This is not something that Paul just went around doing. He's provo- it's been provoked in him, just like it has in Job's, been in Job's case. He says, though I be rude in speech, yeah, I talk plain and uh, you know, don't uh, have all the, the proper uh, speech that uh, some of the Pharisees and some of, even some of maybe the brethren have. He go, Come down to verse... Um, 
Oh, come down to verse 21. He goes on to say, he says, I speak as concerning reproach as though we had been weak. Howbeit, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly. In other words, he's pre- preempting that, saying, listen, I'm not, this is not, I'm not boasting. I'm foolishly speaking. He says, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool again. I am more. All right, this is, this is a provoked confidence that Paul is, is uh, proclaiming here. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I was suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings oft, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen. In perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? If I must needs glory, in other words, if I have to, to, to give all this, these credentials, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. The God of Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. So Paul, in the same boat as Job, had people that were falsely accusing him of whatever, uh, you know, having a, a ulterior motive, you know, uh, not being uh, fit to be an apostle, people trying to... Uh, you know, pull followers away from Paul and, and trying to steer people clear of uh, listening to the Apostle Paul. Paul was provoked to give this uh, history and, and, and the credentials and, and of who he was and how he was, God was using him. Job says, but I have understanding as well as you and I am not inferior to you. There's a time when you may have to... Uh, it may not be in your nature, it may not be in your character. You may not be one to go around, you know, boasting of who you are and, and what you uh, have accomplished. But it may be necessary sometimes to, to do that when you're being uh, accused as, as Job and Paul has been. Job chapter 12, verse 4, he says, I am as one mocked of his neighbor, who calleth upon God and he answereth him. The just upright man is laughed to scorn. Job is, says, I am as one mocked of his neighbor. Dr. Ruckman writes this in his commentary. Job says that it is just as if he had knelt in his living room and prayed, God, will you please show me what's wrong? And then some visitor on the couch said, sure, Job, I'll be glad to. That's what, that's where Job, that's what Job feels like. I mean, he's uh, there's people out there that just, you know, have all the answers and they speak for God. Here Job is a type of Christ being mocked. Remember Job, in his innocence, he has done nothing uh, in a sense to deserve what he's gotten, of, you know, outside of just being a sinner. We all deserve, we know, uh, hell. But uh, in the sense that he's being punished for something specific is not the case. Christ is a, is a type of Christ. Christ was innocent. Christ, uh, everything that he got was, you know, was more innocent than obviously Job is. And in Psalm 22, verse 7 says, All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. That was a pro- prophecy from the book of Psalms that took place, obviously, at the cross when when people walked by and and, and derided Christ and saying, you know, come down from the cross and if you he trusted in God, now let him deliver him. He was, they, they mocked Christ. Job says a just upright man is laughed to scorn. You know, it's typical that one who seeks to do right and keeps his nose clean. You know, if you, if you try to, uh, you know, live conservatively in speaking and, and you know, not uh, just, you know, have to go with all the, the latest fads and, have all the, you know, 
uh, the latest hairstyles and the, you know, all the different fads that come and go, and you just try to live clean and, and do right and uh, not be wrapped up in, in uh, you know, the, the social sins of the, the community and uh, whether it's in school and you're a teenager and you're going through school and or you're a, you know, a person at work that's dealing with uh, people that are, you know, wanting you to hang with them and, and do the things that they do, you're going to be laughed at. You're going to be despised. You're going to be um, uh, laughed to scorn. Christians will even, that worldly Christians that are not living for the Lord, that are not doing right, will even laugh at you. But when it's coming from someone who claims to be righteous, you know, someone who claims to have their ducks in a row, it's a little harder to take. It's one thing when people are, you know, lost people and uh, people that are out in the world and even Christians that are living ungodly and worldly are laughing at you. You kind of, you know, let it, just let it roll off your back. But when somebody who claims to be righteous is, is, is mocking you and laughing you to scorn, it's a little harder to take. Look at Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, come down to verse 14. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things and they derided him. Here, they're deriding Christ. And uh, you just got through telling them that they can't serve two masters. But the Pharisees were those that claimed to be righteous, claimed to have... Uh, you know, the mind of God and doing the things that God uh, wanted them to do. And he said in verse 15 unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass in a, uh, than one tittle of the law to fail. Christ, uh, listen, no doubt there were, there were uh, publicans and sinners that we know, he, we know that they were attracted to Christ and they followed him. And when, when, when he came around, they felt comfortable with Jesus Christ. Why? Because not because he was one of them, you know, not because he was, uh, you know, one of their buds that hanging with them and doing everything that they're doing, but because even though he was perfect, and righteous and holy, he didn't, uh, you know, deride them. They were under conviction, no doubt, but they were comfortable around him because he he knew that they they knew that he was sincere and, and he really cared for them. The Pharisees, on the other hand, did not. Uh, they would point out their sins, which was okay to do, but they would never give him an answer. They would never give them give them help, give them hope. It's one thing when you, you know, go around pointing out people's sins, but you better have some hope to give them, somewhere to turn. Uh, don't be like a Pharisee and just point out people's sins and leave them hanging. He says in verse Job chapter 12 and verse 5, He that is ready to slip with his feet is as a lamp despised in the thought of him that is at ease. Basically, Job is saying that it is easy for his friends to look down on him while he is walking a slippery slope and they are safely perched on their stoop. You know, it's very easy to, while you're healthy and doing all right and things are going good, to, to point the finger at somebody that's going through it thinking that they're doing something wrong. Those who don't feel they are in any danger have no need for a lamp or a light to lighten their path. He says... He that is ready to slip with his feet is as a lamp despised in the thought of him that is at ease. The world despises the word of God because they feel they are in no danger of its warnings. They feel that there is no problem, there is no, there is no merit to the word of God. 
And so they despise this lamp. The only light there is in the world. And they despise it. All right, next week we'll pick up uh, verse 6.